soldier now. Who have left normal life behind to defend their country. Sleeping here, living here, fighting here. Uncovering how a volunteer army can stand up to the Russian war machine. Ukraine, the people's fight. Watch on BBC iPlayer. I'm Laura Trevallin in Washington, and this is BBC World News America. The US Defense Secretary has a rare phone call with his Russian opposite number. The communication between Washington and Moscow comes as tensions are high after the collision between a Russian warplane and a US surveillance drone. There's a new version of the artificial intelligence chatbot which has been making waves. This one can create recipes, say the designers. Officials in Iran say dozens have died during fire festivals across the country. Many are using the events to voice their anger at the government. The wolf population of Europe is growing. Conservationists are pleased and farmers are not. Welcome to World News America in the UK, on PBS and around the globe. We begin tonight here in Washington, where the US Defense Secretary had a rare phone call with his Russian counterpart in the aftermath of a collision between a Russian warplane and an American surveillance drone. Russia's Security Council says it will try and retrieve the wreckage of the US drone that crashed into the Black Sea on Tuesday. Moscow has told Washington to keep well away from its airspace as the two sides blamed each other. For the incident, which took place in international airspace, near territory that Russia claims to have annexed from Ukraine. The US says Russian fighter jets intercepted the drone, causing it to crash, but Moscow denies this. A senior official here in Washington says the US is also assessing whether it can retrieve the drone, which is in very deep waters. The US Defense Secretary said today the episode was part of a pattern of aggressive, risky and unsafe actions by Russian pilots in international airspace. And he said Russia must operate military aircraft safely. As I've said repeatedly, it's important that great powers be models of transparency and communication. And the United States will continue to fly and to operate wherever international law allows. And it is incumbent upon Russia to operate its military aircraft in a safe and professional manner. The U.S. Defense Secretary there. Well, our diplomatic correspondent James Landale reports now from the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. This is the kind of unmanned aircraft that crashed. An MQ-9 Reaper patrolling the skies over the Black Sea, gathering information about the war below, flown remotely by pilots thousands of miles away. And this is the type of Russian warplane the U.S. claims struck their drone, an Su-27 fighter jet, two of which encountered the American aircraft near Crimea early yesterday. US commanders said the Russian planes flew in front of the drone several times and dumped fuel over it, after which the drone's propeller was struck, leaving it spinning out of control. 
But Russia denies causing the crash, saying the drone was approaching Russian territory when it lost control due to what a spokesman described as sharp manoeuvres. I want to underline, Russian fighter jets did not use their onboard weapons, did not come into contact with the unmanned aerial vehicle and returned safely to base. Minister. Ukraine's foreign minister played down the risk of an escalating confrontation between two of the world's nuclear superpowers. As long as Russia controls Crimea, um, this, in this kind of incidents will be uh, inevitable and the Black Sea will not be a safe place. Uh, so the only way to prevent such incidents is actually to kick Russia out of Crimea. Do you fear escalation? No, I think it's just a routine, routine incidents that uh, is happening from time to time. A US spokesman said steps were being taken to protect the wreckage of the drone, but accepted it might be too deep underwater to recover. But Russian officials expressed confidence they could discover what was left. James Land, LBC News, Kyiv. Well, let's analyze U.S.-Russia relations and just how deep U.S. congressional support for Ukraine is in the aftermath of this drone incident. We're joined now by Ron Christie, who worked in the White House of Republican President George W. Bush, and by Anthony Zerka, the BBC's North America correspondent, our resident sages. <laughs> uh, so, Ron, you've worked in the White House. Just how tense are things when the U.S. Defense Secretary has to call his Russian counterpart when a drone has gone down? Do you think this will have lowered the temperature? I hope it did, uh, Laura. Good evening to you. I can tell you for having worked in the White House that it's not just the Secretary of Defense. It's the National Security Advisor. It's the Secretary of State. I imagine if you were on the ground floor of the West Wing of the White House today, there was a buzz of activity in the Situation Room where all the senior National Security Advisors are conferring and saying, what should we do now? How can we de-escalate a conflict? And I guarantee you the decision was made Let's get the Secretary of Defense on with his counterpart and let's try to let some air, let some tension out of this situation. Because, of course, Anthony, the longer this war goes on, the more likelihood there is of some kind of confrontation at the margins between the U.S. and Russia. How deep is congressional support for this war, especially now we have a divided Congress, Republicans controlling the House? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously going to be a, a hard situation for Congress. And I think that support, while deep, may be getting shallow, or particularly on the Republican side. If you look at Republican voters, when you look at polls, it shows that a growing majority of Republican voters don't think the U.S. should be supporting Ukraine the way they have been. Uh, and so that is going to be reflected in Republicans in Congress. Uh, you see Kevin McCarthy already turning down an offer to visit Ukraine and, and being very coy about uh, continued support, military support for the Ukrainians. So it is going to be a challenge, and this just raises those tensions even more and concerns. And when we come to Republican presidential contenders, Ron DeSantis, one of them, said in written answers to Fox News, he referred to this as a territorial dispute between Russia and Ukraine. What do you read into that, Ron? Very interesting. It's, it's sort of the uh, Donald Trump 2.0, right? That we want to be isolationists. We want to pretend that incidents in the world aren't a geostrategic of importance to the United States. But you know what the reality of it is? If the United States doesn't act, if we don't provide support to Ukraine, then some of those issues that are overseas can find their ways on our shores. And I think DeSantis is trying to go after the Trump voters and saying, I'm different than Donald Trump, but in many respects, you want our policies. But Anthony, briefly, in 30 seconds, and I know you can do this because you're a pro, how does this war end from the White House perspective? Well, I think it's going to be a challenge. They, I think, eventually want to have some sort of a settlement, but uh, Republicans are going to make that uh, more and more difficult if they start talking about cutting off uh, aid. And Ron DeSantis is looking at courting Donald Trump's voters. Uh, he was a hardliner back in the 2010, saying he wanted to give offensive and defensive weapons to Ukraine and criticize Obama as being soft on Russia. So here we are. He's moving to where the Republican voters are. OK, stay with us, gentlemen, because we want to hear from you on another topic of the day, which is the wildly popular artificial intelligence chatbot known as ChatGPT. The research lab OpenAI has released the latest version, which it says is more creative and less likely to make up facts. The new model can respond to images, providing recipe suggestions from photos of ingredients. Just take a look at what it came up with for this picture of eggs flour and milk, for example. 
It can also process up to 25,000 words, about eight times as many as the previous version of ChatGPT. OpenAI says the bot demonstrates human-level performance on many standardized tests. GPT-4 performed at the 90th percentile on a simulated bar exam, that's for potential lawyers, the 93rd percentile on an SAT reading exam, and the 89th percentile on the SAT math exam, OpenAI claimed. But they warn it's not perfect yet, the company said in a blog post. GPT-4 still has many known limitations that we're working to address, such as social biases, hallucinations, and adversarial prompts. All right, <laughs> Anthony, adversarial prompts. I don't know what that means, but uh, what do you make of... You've got um, teenagers like me, and I know that mine are using it. So what do you make of the implications of this technology? I mean, it is uh, truly remarkable. Uh, it, it, I was at South by Southwest in Austin this weekend, and that was all anyone was talking about. Uh, and there was one guy there who follows AI who said he would buy dinner for anyone who wasn't freaked the and he used an expletive freaked out uh, about uh, the way AI is developing because it is growing by leaps and bounds and the applications are limitless but the danger is also because there are no guardrails as of yet except for those being imposed by the people coming up with this on limiting this on what it's going to talk about it can be used for disinformation as well as information if you didn't like the bots that you see on social media now wait till they can talk in complete sentences and make Mm -hmm. compelling arguments. Mm. Well, Ron, you're an educator. You teach college students. Have you come across this chatbot? I have. And in fact, it's a sad statement that I actually now have to put in my syllabus a paragraph that says that we are looking out for plagiarism, that we're looking for the use of artificial intelligence for your submitted work. Didn't do that last semester. I've been teaching since 2009. And so this is a very recent phenomenon that educators are going to have to deal with. And I agree with Anthony. I think this is a scary phenomenon. There are no guardrails here. And fortunately for me, I have a pretty good handle of what my students can do. But as this technology evolves, it's going to be more and more difficult for educators to put those guardrails that Anthony was mentioning of making sure that people aren't plagiarizing their work. Well, Anthony, the New York Times reviewer of this latest version of the chatbot said today, uh, he talked about a concept called future shock, that things are just changing so quickly that it's overwhelming. Is this an example of that? This thing that can write essays? That's what I've had students yeah. doing in front of my eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> stunned by what it can do and honestly a little worried professionally because you know it's, it can write some pretty compelling pieces of journalism it could probably write political speeches too yeah. I mean it can it, we, we were afraid that uh, computers were going to take away jobs from truckers and and people and manufacturing well I think they're coming for people like us as well and and because there are no guardrails and because we don't know what direction this is going to go I mean, I think that's the biggest concern. If you look at social media, the way social media wasn't regulated in the early days, people are like, we are not learning our lessons from that for this new technology, which is even more powerful. Yep. Anthony Zerka and Ron Christie, please don't be replaced by bots. Thank you so much <laughs> for joining us. Our pleasure. Well, let's turn to the UK, where the new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has delivered his first budget. The finance minister said the UK economy is set to shrink this year but he's no longer expected to enter a recession. Among the elements of his budget, energy bills for a typical household in Britain will continue to be capped at £2,500 or about $3,000 until the end of June. The 5p cut to fuel duty on petrol and diesel has been frozen for another year. That's good news for those filling up their cars. The duty on pints of beer has also been frozen to help, in the words of Jeremy Hunt, the great British pub. But people drinking at home will see a rise in taxes on other alcohol products like wine and spirits. The Labour opposition leader is not impressed. Sir Keir Starmer has accused the government of dressing up stagnation as stability. A short time ago, I spoke about all of this with the BBC's Rob Watson. Rob, the last time that a UK finance minister made a financial statement, the markets were spooked and eventually a prime minister resigned. So what happened to Jeremy Hunt when he spoke today? Well, he was anxious, I think, to make his budget, well, dare I say this, rather boring. Certainly that's what some politicians said. But they meant it in a rather complimentary way because of what you, what you allude to, Laura, which was the almighty, almighty car crash uh, caused uh, in the economy by, uh, by his predecessor uh, last autumn and by the previous Prime Minister, Liz Truss. So the whole idea uh, of this budget was to say, yeah, we know that Britain has got a growth problem, but we're not going to do anything that spooks the market.
Rob, the International Monetary Fund is forecasting that Britain will be the only major economy to contract this year. Why is Britain uniquely in this position? Well, it's a combination of things, Laura. I mean, the most obvious ones to lots of people around the world will be Brexit, uh, Britain making it more difficult to trade with its biggest market, the European Union, and also stopping the free movement of labour from the European Union. But some of it is historic as well. So both the British government and industry have, it said, underinvested in things like sort of skills in the workforce and in infrastructure. It's because it's difficult to plan stuff in Britain. So it's difficult to get new houses built, new factories. So it's a sort of a whole cocktail of underinvestment, the years of austerity and Brexit. And Rob, the instability in the financial markets that started here with these two banks being closed, is that spreading to Europe with Credit Suisse and could it affect the UK economy? I mean, certainly the view in London, Laura, so far is so far so good. I mean, I think there is a feeling in the sort of financial and political world that the sort of uh, reforms that were carried out in the wake of the financial crash in 2008 mean uh, they hope that uh, the British banks are safe and this is of course a major banking centre of course earlier in the week the British government and the, the Treasury the Finance Department here had, had taken measures to make sure there weren't any kind of knock-on effects because of the collapse of the bank in, in the United States but absolutely people will be looking nervously and you know people in London can see what's happening to share prices of banks on other stock markets Rob Watson in a sparkly looking Westminster tonight. Thank you. Well, let's take a closer look at the troubled global banking sector that Rob was talking about there. It's been a turbulent day on world stock markets. There are fears that more financial institutions could face trouble after the collapse of the US based Silicon Valley Bank. Shares in the bank Credit Suisse plunged, ending the day down almost 25%. The Swiss bank's fall came after the Saudi National Bank. Credit Suisse's largest investor said it couldn't provide any more financial assistance. The Swiss bank has struggled with scandals, legal issues and leadership changes in recent weeks. Our correspondent Michelle Fleury has more. A lot of banks hold assets um, which have lost value because of the recent increase in interest rates. Now, typically, banks will hedge their risk. Uh, they can buy products that can kind of protect them against that. And what has happened is that as customers rush to these banks to pull out their money, in some cases they're forced to raise more capital, so they sell some of these assets at a loss. Now, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, they weren't very good at protecting themselves against such a scenario, and that's why they ran into trouble. And investors subsequently have been looking around, casting their eye across the banking sector and going, OK, well, who else has these problems with unrealized losses, as they call it in the business? Uh, and attention has started to focus on Credit Suisse. What is interesting is, as you say, we've heard comments from the chair today coming out saying we have strong capital base, we have uh, strong regulations, we're in a good position. But the fact that you have these comments from its biggest backer saying it won't be able to lend it any more money should it run into trouble, I think that really has spooked investors right now. And it'll be interesting to see how central bankers respond because you've got the ECB, the European Central Bank, meeting and expected to raise rates by 50 basis points tomorrow. That was before all of this happened. And then you've got the Federal Reserve in America having its policy rate setting meeting next week. Michelle Flurry reporting there from New York. In other news now, Britain is in the midst of one off, if not its biggest, day of strikes since a wave of industrial action began last year, sparked by soaring inflation. Hundreds of thousands of workers have walked out in disputes over paying conditions. The Finance Minister, Jeremy Hunt, is expected to tell Parliament that free childcare will be expanded to lure people back into the workforce. Police in Pakistan have been ordered to suspend an operation to arrest the opposition leader, Imran Khan, until Thursday morning. The directive followed a brawl between security forces and supporters of Mr Khan outside his residence in the city of Lahore. The confrontation began on Tuesday when police tried to arrest the former prime minister for failing to appear in court over corruption charges. Mr Khan says the charges are politically motivated. In European football news, Eintracht Frankfurt football fans clashed with police today after arriving in Naples, despite being banned from attending tonight's Champions League match against Napoli. A police car was set on fire by hundreds of supporters. Smoke bombs and flares were thrown at officers who responded with tear gas. 
Local media said Eintracht fans were also attacked by Napoli Ultras. 14 people have died and several others are missing after floods swept through the streets of two cities in southeast Turkey devastated by last month's earthquakes. Among the victims were quake survivors who'd been living in container homes since the quakes. The latest disaster came only five weeks after the twin earthquakes in which 48,000 people were killed and many more left homeless. In Iran, at least 26 people have died and many others were injured while celebrating a traditional fire festival ahead of the Persian New Year. The authorities say the deaths were caused by homemade fireworks. According to videos posted online, many used the occasion to protest and shout anti-government slogans. Parham Gabadi reports. For freedom, they sing, burning their headscarves. This is the fire festival in Iran, an ancient Persian ritual, a chance to dance. But this year, to also protest. Scenes like these can potentially lead to your arrest in Iran. Dancing in public, especially without a hijab, is not tolerated by the Islamic regime. Like these girls who were immediately arrested last week when their video went viral. They were released after making a public apology. But Iran's Generation Z, who has been at the forefront of anti-government protest which swept the country in September, has shown no fear. In this video, verified by BBC Persian, protesters in the capital Tehran threw handmade fireworks at the riot police as they tried to move in. The Iranian authorities have given a muted response focusing on the number of dead from the fireworks. This year, at least 26 people were killed, which is five more than last year. The protests started after the death of a young Kurdish woman, Mahsa Amini, in police custody for allegedly not wearing her hijab properly. <laughs> woman, life, freedom is the chant. Young people have not forgiven or forgotten here, in northern city of Rasht, they shout that Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei will be overthrown this year. They say they want an end to the clerical establishment. Parham Ghabadi, BBC News. Well, from the streets of Iran, we turn to the plains of Africa, where a lion known as the King of the Serengeti has been killed by his rivals. Tributes have poured in for Bob Jr., known as the most handsome and photogenic lion in Africa. Local media said the Serengeti King was killed over the weekend by a pack of younger, fitter lions. Wildlife officials are preparing a special burial. Staying with the wildlife theme, and it may surprise you to learn that the number of wolves in Europe is growing. Conservationists welcome the news, though others, especially farmers, say it's deeply alarming. Around 19,000 wolves are thought to be living across 27 European countries. Jessica Parker reports. On heathland in the east of Belgium, a pack of wolves is on patrol. Curious about a camera set up to track them. And we're just looking for... Searching for signs of wolves in the area, Jan, a researcher, knows exactly so, what sorry, to look this, for. Then? So this is, this is wolf feces? This is wolf feces, yeah. What remains after the rain is, is just some hairs of the, of the prey. Why are their numbers growing in Europe and why are they back mm -hmm. in Belgium for the first time in over 100 years? Yeah. The reason why they are back is mainly legal protection. From the early 90s, really a lot has happened in Europe and the wolves really started to disperse all over the continent. The wolves sometimes roam here in Bainven Forest and this is one of the cameras that is keeping an eye on them. There's up to 40 of these across this part of eastern Belgium and it tracks the wolf's movements, their well-being, whether they might have been injured, as well as their numbers throughout the year. But also traceable are the rising attacks on livestock. That's led EU lawmakers to challenge the wolf's protected status. Come, 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 come. Johan, a come. farmer, says he's lost dozens of sheep and that current compensation fails to cover the true cost. Every morning when we go look to the, to the sheep, to the field, uh, you are afraid to find some sheep killed. Some people might say you just need to build a better fence. 
Yes, uh, what have you done no more? Uh, we can uh, use more wires, use mo more sticks, but I don't think that there is uh, a wall of proof fence doesn't exist. The, the wolf is so smart, he overwins every fence. Here in its jaws, a wolf holds a baby wild boar. Its mother gives chase, but it's too late. Wolves are predators, with warnings their growing numbers in Europe cannot go unchecked. So here we have another wolf print. But why are they a positive thing? Why is it positive that they're back? Yeah. Well, first of all, of course, you need to maybe also ask if everything has to have like a positive effect on the way we see it as humans. Some animals also just have a right to exist, not just because we find them useful. These evasive creatures can be hard to spot, but across this densely populated region, their presence is getting noticed. Jessica Parker, BBC News, in Belgium. And finally tonight, this is my last World News America broadcast and indeed my very last day at the BBC. Over the past 30 years, I've had the honour of working with incredible BBC journalists covering the most important stories across the globe. What a privilege to work with colleagues who've become close friends on our joint mission of bringing the story to you, our viewers. Most importantly, I want to thank all of you, our audience, who are at the very heart of what we do, whether on PBS here in the United States, in the UK or around the world, it's just been such a privilege to bring you the news each night. The team here will carry on doing that for you, I promise. I'm moving on to new adventures, but just like you, I'll be tuning in. It has been an absolute honour. For one last time, I'm Laura Trevelyan. Thank you for watching World News America. Hello there. We continue to see some big swings in temperature.